what you get for breakfast is something that if we do our jobs right, you will wake up to news that you didn't know the night before. It's a conversation. It's not just me and Eamon. We want to get to know you and we want you to get to know us. From six, it's breakfast with Eamon and Isabel. Monday to Thursdays on GB News. Britain's news channel. Westminster is going around in ever-decreasing circles, followed by the media. Britain is broken. How on earth did we get into this mess? But more importantly, how do we get out of it? Join me at 7pm, Monday to Thursdays, on Farage, here on GB News. We will have open, rational debate. We've got to work out how Britain moves forward from this. Join us here on GB News, the People's Channel. Britain is watching. When the news happens, it happens here. And really important breaking news. Breaking news this morning. On TV, radio and online, the news starts here on Britain's Newsroom. All the biggest stories and the answers that you need from across the UK and beyond. Join Britain's Newsroom from 9.30 on GB News. The People's Channel, Britain's news channel. Join me, Patrick Christie's Monday to Friday, 3 till 6. We tackle the day's news agenda like you've never seen before. It's high tempo, high octane, the most controversial topics and the best guests. You will not be able to take your eyes and ears off it. I'm not afraid to ask the questions that you really want answered. 3 till 6 p.m. Monday to Friday on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. People in Britain, they love free speech, but they also love fair play. I don't care if I'm speaking somebody from a trade union, from the Labour Party, somebody from the SNP. And I think the viewers like to see that actually we can challenge one another, but in a positive way. We think we ask the questions that people want to ask, and often we ask the questions that we wanted to ask in Parliament, but never got the chance to ask. So join us every Saturday, 10 a.m. till noon on GB News. Britain's news channel. Hi, I'm Dan Wooten. You can watch me live on GB News Monday to Thursday from 9pm. And did you know that you can also watch and listen live on our website, gbnews.com. You'll always be up to date on the latest breaking news, as well as enjoying the best stories, opinions and shows. You can even join the debate under our live player as you're watching. So head straight to gbnews.com on TV, radio and online. GB News, Britain's news channel. It's all about family, being in people's living rooms, all the interaction and getting to know who our viewers and listeners are. When I was young, my dad used to say, no, no, stop arguing. I wanted an outlet that would enable me to give my opinion. People are going through a really hard time right now. And I know that you don't feel like you're being listened to by the establishment. I came to GB News because it's the people's channel and I want the audience to have their say on the events of the day. We're dynamic. We do something different. Democracy shows that the wisdom of the nation is in its people. I get to travel to find out what the story is from a personal perspective. The British people aren't fools. We know when we're not being told the full story. We've got to work out how Britain moves forward from this. It's the best country in the world. The establishment had their chance. Now we're here to represent your views. Britain's watching. Britain's watching. Britain's watching. We're proud to be GB News. The People's Channel. Britain's News Channel. Welcome to Gloria Meets. We've got the former deputy leader of the Labour Party, Tom Watson. I feel deep regret for that, and, and uh, I need to put that matter right. Conservative MP Sarah Brickcliffe describes the trauma of growing up with an alcoholic mum who she lost when she was nine. My mum was alcoholic. Former Conservative Cabinet Minister David Meller. But she believed in something with a passion, and she worked it. And when I look at somebody who's insipid, I'm trying to just look for a parliamentary word. These insipid creatures that have replaced her. Conservative MP Bim Afalome. I think we need to defund some of those courses that are giving bad outcomes to young people and putting that money into further education. All that after your news. Good evening, I'm Rory Smith in the GB newsroom. The government has sent a rapid deployment team to roads to support British nationals as wildfires continue to spread across Greece. Evacuations are being described as the biggest in the country's history. Thousands of people are fleeing homes and hotels. 
Several holiday firms, including Jet2, TUI and Thomas Cook, have cancelled all flights to the island until the end of the month. Labour says its party gathering this weekend has led the groundwork for an election-winning manifesto. A spokesperson says the final document produced by the National Policy Forum contains no unfunded spending commitments and will lead to the building of a better Britain. But the Unite Union says it can't support the document due to what it described as the weakening of language around zero-hour contracts. Sadiq Khan is pressing ahead with plans to expand London's ultra-low emission zone, despite opposition from within his own party. The ULEZ policy was widely blamed for Labour failing to win the seat of Oxbridge and South Ryslip at last week's by-elections. It comes as Conservative MP Michael Gove warns against treating the environment as a religious crusade and says that some net zero measures should be relaxed. The British pop singer Vince Hill has died at the age of 89. His version of Edelweiss, first heard in The Sound of Music, reached number two on the UK charts in 1967. In a career that included 25 studio albums, he worked with some of Britain's best-loved musical legends, including Dame Vera Lynn and Cilla Black. He passed away peacefully at home in Oxfordshire. TV, online, DAB Plus Radio and on TuneIn. This is GB News. Now it's time for Gloria Meets. Tom Watson, you were a Labour MP from 2001 to 2019. You were a former deputy leader of the Labour Party. We're going to talk about some of those things throughout this interview, but I want to start by saying you lost a lot of weight in the last five years, didn't you? I did. I was diagnosed with type 2 diabetes. I had two young kids. I thought I was going to die. And so I used my time effectively and lost eight stone and put diabetes in remission. Diabetes is now in remission. Just key lessons that we should follow then, if anybody is wanting to make a change to their life. Well, for me, it was a series of tiny changes over time. I cut out sweets and sugar, which obviously if you've got type 2 diabetes is the first thing you do. I changed my nutrition. I stopped taking ultra-processed food. I lowered my carbohydrate intake. I tried to cook real meals, not um, frozen meals. Um, I set myself a step count and slowly put it up. I even bought a bike when I'd lost a bit of weight as a reward to myself. I'm a little bit overweight again now because I was caring for an elderly parent uh, who was very poorly. But I know that I can do it now. And so I've got a little reset where I get my step count back up again and monitor my food and it doesn't frighten me anymore and I'm not in denial about it. So let's talk about your time as deputy leader of the Labour Party. This was a very difficult period for the Labour Party. You are, you've always been on the centre ground of the Labour Party. You are deputy to Jeremy Corbyn, who is on the left of the Labour Party. The two traditions in the Labour Party, they, they, they clash. The Labour Party is in civil war. How does that personally affect someone who is in that position? Well, you kind of, um, you're in these jobs temporarily, and I felt very responsible that I, I was temporarily in control of a 100-year-old institution, a really important, powerful vehicle for changing lives that had dramatically changed the um, lives of many millions of working people over that time. So I felt worried for the institution. I obviously felt worried for the country. Uh, and at first tried to use the usual means. You have to, you know, try and influence change through the committees and the shadow cabinet, but then realised there was a little bit more going on and it became very difficult in the latter years. What was the toughest moment for you? I, well, certainly the toughest moment I had in politics was actually in that period it was when our colleague Joe Cox was assassinated. Um, I mean, nothing prepares you for that. But actually, in terms of the actual um, disagreements in the Labour Party, I think when I realised that really 
there was just so really irresponsible people was when they tried to abolish the post of deputy leader quite late on, they, they, they moved an emergency motion under any other business at a meeting to try it. They didn't like what I had to say, so they would try to abolish the post. And that's when I realized actually two things. Firstly, they were just not serious about power. They were not serious about government, but also it was probably time for me to leave politics. It, uh, you, you know, at that point in time, I'd probably done everything I can to try and hold the Labour Party together and the next generation needed to take over. Jeremy Corbyn is no longer a Labour MP. Can you ever see any circumstances that he's let back in? I doubt it. He's probably taken it too far now. I think he probably knows that. Um, and I think Keir Starmer gave him a fair hearing. He needed him to apologise uh, and he refused to do so. And I think he quite likes it on the outside now. Might he stand as an independent? Should the Labour Party be worried about that prospect? I, I don't think it really matters. If he runs as an independent in his constituency or for another position, I, I think actually that will probably help the Labour Party because in those red wall seats, there's a whole load of working class people who are, were very frightened of Jeremy Corbyn government. And for Jeremy to be running against Keir Starmer will probably help Keir Starmer, I suspect. Interesting. Right, let's talk about when you really came to public prominence. You led a campaign, a, a war really, against Rupert Murdoch. The News of the World closed down. Some journalists went to prison. What did you learn about that experience? Would you have done anything differently looking back? Well, firstly, it wasn't a war against Rupert Murdoch. Okay. It, it was a sustained campaign to get the truth out, because let's remind people, a very powerful, perhaps the most powerful media organisation on the planet consistently broke the law, they corrupted police officers and people in public office, and they hacked the phones of people who were the victims of serious crime, very famously Millie Dowler's phone. Um, and all the institutions of the state, the checks and balances that were supposed to hold those people to account failed, the police failed, parliament failed, they didn't do their jobs. Um, so I guess, um, I mean, at the time it was very frightening and it was very difficult and it was very intense. I guess you could say now that press standards uh, at the tabloid end of the operation, and the least you could say is I suspect they don't break the law on a daily basis like they appeared to do 20 years ago. Um, but I don't think the full story has been told yet. The last government shelved the second part of the public inquiry that was to look into the corrupt relationship between the police and journalists. We don't know whether there are corrupt police officers still working for the Met Police who sold people's private and confidential information to newspapers for profit. Uh, and when you look at the concern about the culture of the Metropolitan Police today, only this week we've seen they accepted that the Daniel Morgan murder inquiry was a corrupt endeavour, um, then we, we cannot know, we still don't know the truth. So if I was in government today, I would still want to know what that corrupt relationship between the police and the tabloid press was. There was another campaign which you led in your time as an MP. You faced a lot of criticism for this. It was over your role which resulted into police investigations into historic sexual crimes, some prominent people were wrongly accused and went, went through hell. Leon Britton was one of those people. Y you apologised to his wife, Lady Britton. Did she accept that apology? Not at first, actually. Um, and in politics, you know, sometimes deeds, not words, matter. Uh, I'm very pleased to say that she did accept my apology when I gave it. And I gave it with a commitment to try and work with her to achieve police changes, reforms that came out of that inquiry. I mean, let's not forget that some historic child sexual crimes were investigated and people did go to jail. But in all the sort of feverish investigation, one corrupt individual made false allegations and people were harmed because of those false allegations. I feel deep regret for that, and, and uh, I need to put that matter right. How, how do you do that? 
Well, actually, one of the, th the, the inquiry that came out of that, um, that episode made recommendations for metropolitan police reform. And I actually, the, one of the first meetings I had when I was put in the House of Lords was with Sir Mark Riley, the head of the Met Police at present. And he committed to uh, get back to me on the progress on reforms. I'm sad to say that six months later, uh, after a number of chase-ups, I'm still waiting for the courtesy of a response to that commitment. But I'm not going to let it go. And if he won't give me private reassurances, then I'm going to have to be more vocal in my criticisms and demands for change in the Metropolitan Police. Final question. There is a scenario if Jeremy Corbyn had resigned and you had been, when you were deputy leader, you would have become acting leader of the Labour Party. Very different Labour Party now. But if you were leader today, what's the number one thing you think you still have to nail to seal the deal between the British people and the Labour Party? Well, for a start, I would have been a very reluctant leader. I never wanted that job. Um, and this is about, you're trying to get me to give advice to Keir Starmer. So I've, I've never have done, but for you, Gloria, I will. If I was Keir, I would say every day, put, you, put yourself in the shoes of the working people of this country. They're struggling. They're find, their kids are finding it hard to find secure work. They're finding it hard to pay their rent and mortgages. The shopping bills have gone up nearly 20%. Put yourself in their shoes every day. And every decision you make should be a decision on their behalf. And if you can do that between now and the general election, you won't go far wrong. Two years you've made me wait for this interview. <laughs> <laughs> um, thank you for finally giving in. Tom Watson, thank you. Thank you. Pleasure. Coming up, Sarah Britcliffe. What she used to do was she used to take me up to bed and she'd then go and drink a bottle of vodka whilst I was chucked upstairs in bed. Coming up, David Meller. Why is politics a full-time job? Why is it a profession? That warm feeling inside. From Boxed Boilers. Proud sponsors of weather on GB News. Hello and welcome to your latest weather update from the Met Office. I'm Marco Patania. We hold on to unsettled weather conditions across the UK during the week ahead. I think we'll all see further rain at times and feeling quite chilly too in the brisk breeze. Low pressure is dominating at the moment, a fairly deep area of low pressure, gradually pulling away towards the east of the UK over the next day or so. But notice this snow moving band of rain across the central slice of the UK that continues to give some heavy bursts through the evening. In fact, we have a weather warning in force until midnight. And that band then pushes south into southern parts of England and Wales into the early hours. The far southeast holds on to some clear spells and clearer with a few showers towards the north and northwest, but turning chilly under those clear slots towards the northwest too. Temperatures into single figures here. As for Monday, well, it's a case of fairly wet conditions across the south during the morning, some heavy bursts of rain at times, giving way to brighter skies from the north and northwest, but fresh air moving in too. So as we head into the afternoon, most parts are becoming brighter, still a scattering of showers, particularly towards the north and northwest. And once again, fairly chilly for the time of year. Temperatures generally peaking in the mid-teens towards the north, a high down towards the south of 19 or 20, 20 or 68 in Fahrenheit. Tuesday looks set. That warm feeling inside from Boxed Boilers. Proud sponsors of weather on GB News. What you get for breakfast is something that, if we do our jobs right, you will wake up to news that you didn't know the night before. It's a conversation. It's not just me and Eamon. We want to get to know you, and we want you to get to know us. From 6, it's Breakfast with Eamon and Isabel. Monday to Thursdays on GB News. Britain's news channel. Westminster is going around in ever-decreasing circles, followed by the media. Britain is broken. How on earth did we get into this mess? But more importantly, how do we get out of it? Join me at 7pm, Monday to Thursdays, on Farage, here on GB News. We will have open, rational debate. We've got to work out how Britain moves forward from this. Join us here on GB News, the people's channel. Britain is watching. When the news happens, it happens here. And really important breaking news. Breaking news this morning. On TV, radio and online, the news starts here on Britain's Newsroom. All the biggest stories and the answers that you need from across the UK and beyond. Join Britain's Newsroom from 9.30 on GB News. The People's Channel, Britain's news channel.
Join me, Patrick Christie's Monday to Friday, 3 till 6. We tackle the day's news agenda like you've never seen before. It's high tempo, high octane, the most controversial topics and the best guests. You will not be able to take your eyes and ears off it. I'm not afraid to ask the questions that you really want answered. 3 till 6 p.m. Monday to Friday on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. People in Britain, they love free speech, but they also love fair play. I don't care if I'm speaking somebody from a trade union, from the Labour Party, somebody from the SNP. And I think the viewers like to see that actually we can challenge one another, but in a positive way. We think we ask the questions that people want to ask, and often we ask the questions that we wanted to ask in Parliament, but never got the chance to ask. So join us every Saturday, 10 a.m. till noon on GB News. Britain's news channel. It's all about family, being in people's living rooms, all the interaction and getting to know who our viewers and listeners are. When I was young, my dad used to say, no, no, stop arguing. I wanted an outlet that would enable me to give my opinion. People are going through a really hard time right now. And I know that you don't feel like you're being listened to by the establishment. I came to GB News because it's the people's channel and I want the audience to have their say on the events of the day. We're dynamic. We do something different. Democracy shows that the wisdom of the nation is in its people. I get to travel to find out what the story is from a personal perspective. The British people aren't fools. We know when we're not being told the full story. We've got to work out how Britain moves forward from this. It's the best country in the world. The establishment had their chance. Now we're here to represent your views. Britain's watching. Britain's watching. Britain's watching. We're proud to be GB News. The People's Channel. Britain's News Channel. Sarah Brickcliffe the youngest ever Conservative MP elected in uh, 2019, when you were 24. I'm going to start by taking you back to something terrible that I read that happened to you. You lost your mum, Gabrielle, when you were nine years old in 2004. What happened? Um, my mum was alcoholic. Oh, God. Um, she, she was the best woman that you could ever meet. Best woman you could ever meet. And she loved me so much and everybody knew it. Anybody who knew my mum knew how attached she was to me. She wouldn't leave my side. And that was one of the problems because it was mum and daughter. My brothers have uh, a different mum to me. And she struggled throughout my life, um, but she was very good at hiding it from my dad. So what she used to do was she used to take me up to bed and she'd then go and drink a bottle of vodka whilst I was tucked upstairs in bed. And so my family didn't realise that, well, what was happening really with her. Um, and I think it was when my grandma was still alive, she'd fallen down the stairs or something like Your that. Your mum has. Yeah, and that's when my grandma realised that she, she was potentially an alcoholic. But we also had the problem where her family in Germany didn't believe it either. Um, so it, it got to the position where we found myself in some really difficult situations with my mum, where I think my dad went abroad with the boys um, and my mum was looking after me. And again, nobody realised that she was an alcoholic. And she ended up locking me in the house. Um, and she went and she, she'd gone and had a drink and the fire brigade had to come and get me out. Um, How old were you? Probably four or five years old at that point. Um, so that's when people realised that there was a problem, a huge problem. And I absolutely despised my dad throughout this and it, it wasn't his fault, but it felt like he was taking me away uh, from my mum because social services got involved and said, if Gabby doesn't move out of the family home, we're taking Sara into care. Um, Sarah, this is... Yeah, so, it sh but honestly, I, I remember everything about my mum and she just loved me. And anybody that you met would tell you she adored me. And that was one of the problems because everybody would always say to me, as a young girl at the age of four, five, six years old, that the only way that she would stop drinking is because of me. And that pressure that existed as a little girl that the only way that your mum would survive was for you to do something about it, that you could fix it. It wasn't the case. And that's why I think a lot of support is needed for families of alcoholics. Um, 
because there was a time when I remember uh, it was all over the papers because my dad at the time was the leader of the council. Yes. Um, and she'd left me in Manchester airport and she'd had a drink in the airport and we were going to Germany to see my family in Germany. And she got on the plane and was arrested on the plane for being drunk and disorderly. How old, how old, how old are you? Probably five, six years old at that point. So I remember, I don't, I don't remember everything about it because obviously I was quite young, but I remember being sat in the police station in Manchester airport waiting for my dad to pick me up. Um, there was a time in Germany and that this is probably one of the worst moments that I remember, but we'd gone to Germany. It must have been prior because I was allowed to travel with her at that point. Um, and my grandma and granddad were quite ill. They were in the 90s, 80s, 90s. And we used to, she just was so protective of me. We used to sleep in the same bed. We'd cuddle up at night. Um, and I remember her turning round to me in bed and saying, I'm going to die now, Sarah. But she, she turned around to me and she said, I'm going to die now, Sarah. And I was so young. Um, but I'd grown up a lot because I'd already experienced all of this with her. Um, and so I ran downstairs and I knew, I think it was my grandma was really ill at that point. So I ran down the first um, set of stairs, went down into the living room and I picked up the phone to ring my auntie in Germany. I said, mummy's telling me she's going to die. And my auntie just, she wasn't listening. I, I remember just not taking it in. I said, mummy is telling me she's going to die. And so my auntie came, put me in bed with my grandma and my mum was fine the next day. And that was just her having too much to drink. There were times where I used to go into the house and when you're a kid, you, you see all of these TV programs as, as to how you look after someone when they're not feeling well. And I remember seeing something of, of when somebody can't breathe, they breathe into a bag. That's all I could remember. And I remember my mum saying to me, I can't breathe, I just can't breathe. So I'd go and get a plastic bag and put it on her mouth because I didn't want anybody coming into the house and taking her away from me again and taking her into rehab. Um, so there was, a, there was a constant battle between my dad having to do what he had to do to protect me, but obviously his little girl despising him because she wanted to be with mum. If you were making changes now, that would have helped you as the child of an alcoholic and there are campaigns on this. Yes. There are people on both sides of the House of Commons who have grown up in the situation which you describe. I don't think I've heard it described as, as powerfully as this, I would say. Mm -hmm. Is there anything that could have made your childhood better? It's, it's, yes, it's a support around a person coming out of rehab because what happened was my mum moved into a, a, a council house um, she'd be cared for 24-7 in Harvey House in Lancaster. But then what happens is she goes home and then once I've left the house, who's there? Who's there to give her the support that she needed and, and the advice? So what she did instantly was she'd, she'd go and get a bottle of vodka. So she'd last for about six weeks and my dad would be like, this is brilliant, you can look after Sarah. And I remember him doing that once and she'd, I'd walked, it was only across the road from my dad's house. Literally, you could run through the graveyard, climb over my mum's back wall, and I'd be in the house. Um, and he said, right, well, I'm having a night out with friends tonight. Gabby can look after Sarah. So I was so excited. My mum was looking after me for the first time. She was coming to my dad's house to do it. And I remember turning up at the house and she'd obviously drank a, a lot. And I didn't want to tell my dad that. Um, so I walked her round to my dad's house where she fell over a wall and split her head off. This was all before the age of nine years old. Um, and I didn't want to tell my dad because I wanted her to be able to look after me again. Um, so sh I sat in my dad's house with a piece of tissue on her head where she'd been bleeding until my dad got home because I just didn't want anybody to take that opportunity away from me. So the support for people when they come out of rehab, that they're not just sat on their own in, in the home, I think is key. But also, it's not just about the children who need the support, it's more awareness that actually, for example, people telling me that I could fix my mum being an alcoholic, people understanding that being an alcoholic is an illness 
it's 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 still so so stigmatized i mean we hear it all the time about oh, it's drunk things like that it's an illness and without the right support you end up in a catastrophic situation like my mum did I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm i'm actually pretty lost for words what are the implications as you grow up as you become a an, an adult, an adult. Um, so I struggled throughout my teenage life with this because it's mum and daughter, isn't it? It's like a dad and a son. And so you miss out on the opportunity. When your friends used to go, oh, my mum's taking me shopping this week. Everything like that, you just miss out on. Now I had some motherly figures in my life, which I was very lucky to have, but it didn't fully hit me until I went to university. And that was moving out of the family home, moving away from my brothers and my dad. And I started to really, really struggle with my mental health. Um, and my doctor prescribed me with paroxetine. And it was 20 milligrams, really, really quite a high strength. And so I was on that for the first year of university. And I actually ended up failing my first year of university because I struggled to leave the house. And I think that was just because the first, it was the first time I'd been away from the support that I'd had. And the first time it really hit me about being alone and having to deal with the thoughts of, of what I've been dealing with since I was nine years old. So I, I had just four or five years where I really, really struggled with my mental health to the point of wanting to take my own life. How are you now? Because you've gone on to lead this remarkable life. I mean, it doesn't, I still struggle. Um, I mean, it's nearly 20 years now since I lost my mum. And the worst bit for me is I'm starting to forget a voice. Things like that. Um, but actually, mentally, I'm in a really good position. But that's because I, I sought support. Can you tell me about that support? Yeah. So you got, you, you, you got some antidepressants, you went to see your doctor. Yeah. What else helped you? Um, well, I think being thrown in at the deep end with this job kind of made you too busy to even think about anything. So that, again, delayed the process of me suffering because I just was so focused on the job. And I absolutely love the job because you can make a difference. But then after the pandemic, things started to ease off. You had more time to think. I wasn't getting that work-life balance because you don't, you know, Gloria, it's so difficult to find the work-life balance in this job. And so I actually sought support through Parliament um, and it's massively helped. But I wouldn't say that I've ever been at the stage during my parliamentary career as to the stage that I was at university because somehow I'd, I'd fixed myself in a sense. That is the most remarkable interview. Yeah. How proud your mum would yeah. be and your dad must be of what you have achieved and what you've overcome and the bravery you have exhibited today will help others too. We've never met before. No. It's a pleasure to meet you. Sarah Brickliffe, thank, thank you. Much. Thank you. Coming up, David Meller. Despised, <laughs> it was rejected and thrown out. Coming up, Bim Afalome. And I just do not think for most people, particularly millennials, Aged under 40, that is the thing. It's going to be getting their economic opportunities up, making sure they make more money, that's earnings and cutting their taxes, and giving them opportunities to own a home. The Live Desk with me, Mark Longhurst. And me, Pip Thompson. It's here Monday to Friday on GB News. From midday, we'll bring you the news as it breaks, whenever it's happening and wherever it's happening from across the UK and around the world. Refreshing, feisty, but with a bit of fun too. If it matters to you, we'll have it covered on TV, radio and online. Join the live desk on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. So Jubes and Co, we tackle the issues of the day with real robust debate. Both sides of the fence, battling it out with me in the middle with my forthright opinions and views. And often really interesting things happen because you start with a position and then by the end of the debate, you find actually, well, I might not have thought about that one. What we need in this country is two new political parties. You should maybe think about doing a 2024 calendar. <coughs> I'm Michelle Jubry and I'm keeping you company right through until seven o'clock this evening. GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's watching.
Monday to Thursday, 9 p.m. till 11 p.m. Join me, Dan Wooten. I'll bring you the sharpest takes and hottest debates. Do you okay. not believe in prisons? I, I don't believe in prisons. I'm completely right. stunned. I guarantee you there'll be no spin, no bias, no censorship. I actually was personally quite offended by it. And no reason to go to bed. So I guess they've always been quite woke. That's Dan Wooten tonight on TV, radio and online. Monday to Thursday from 9 p.m. till 11 p.m. on GB News. The People's Channel. Britain's news channel. In a world of dull and predictable radio and TV shows. Oh, hi. On Mark Dolan tonight, we've got big guests. We drill into the big stories of the day. <laughs> the show adds up to a brilliant listening and viewing experience. Mark Dolan tonight is the most entertaining current affairs show ever. And that's a fact. That's Mark Dolan tonight, Friday, Saturday and Sunday from 9. Only on GB News. Britain's news channel like all families, we have arguments every now and then, but actually we agree on what the mission of GB News is, and that's the most fundamentally important thing. GB News provides the kind of platform that lets all voices be heard. We don't hold back. We're free to say what we really think. Just because some people who live in a tiny little Westminster bubble think that their particular story is important, that's not the most important story for me. And often, they will be difficult stories, stories that you won't find on the establishment media. Because what people think in the north of England may be very different to what they're thinking in the home counties. We're going to carry on telling the world what life is really like for households up and down the UK. We love to be in your car, in your kitchen as you're having your breakfast, Whatever you're doing, you are part of the show. If it matters to you, it matters to us. Britain's watching. Britain's watching. Britain's watching. We're proud to be GB News. The People's Channel. Britain's News Channel. David Meller, uh, this is your life and times uh, conservative... In nine minutes. <laughs> We can get through a lot. Um, you were a Conservative cabinet minister. You were a Conservative MP from 1979 to 1997. During that long tenure, you must have witnessed some big changes in, in politics. What, what struck you? What strikes you looking back? Well, I think that um, this was a period which was very much Mrs Thatcher's period. I, by the way, was her youngest minister for four years and I was in her government for nine years. But it, I didn't worship Margaret Thatcher. She treated me with the same contempt that my mother always did. And, uh, you know, and I loved my mother. And I sort of half loved Margaret Thatcher. But she wasn't an easy person uh, to work with or work for. And on occasions would quite lose it. I remember one time at a cocktail party, she literally pinned me up against a wall and told me I was in the room and told me I was uh, letting her down on certain things. It never bothered her that she was letting a lot of us down by being extremely disloyal that, um, you know, to, to, her, to ministers by telling people like Mary Whitehouse that she didn't agree with the policy I was espousing, which was a policy of the government. So, you know, she was naughty. Uh, I mean, it was that, was it Dick Emerson said, naughty but nice. She wasn't actually nice, but what she was was naughty because... She had no, she expected higher standards of others than she ever devoted herself. But she believed in something with a passion and she worked it. And when I look at some of these insipid, I'm trying to just look for a parliamentary word, these insipid creatures that have replaced her. I mean, you know, look, Rishi Sunak's, I'm sure, a very clever guy and all the rest of it. But where's the Margaret Thatcher in Rishi Sunak? Maybe Mrs. Sunak knows, but I certainly don't. Wow. So you think the quality of our politicians, we don't get those big towering figures anymore? No, it's not even this question of big towering figures. It's a question of people who are any good at what they're doing and have real gifts. And I think that um, I had an interesting conversation actually years ago with Dennis Healy when I was speaking at a big dinner in Leeds in honour of Dennis Healy. And um, I always got on well with Dennis, although we would always sort of mess about. And... I made the point that when Dennis Healy was at Oxford, uh, Balliol in the 1930s, there were three outstanding undergraduates there, Roy Jenkins, Ted Heath and him. And I said every one of them went on to a major career in politics. 
And my question I said to this dinner is, today, if there were similar, three similarly gifted people at Oxford University or wherever, would they all go into politics? My view is that none of them would. And it's quite interesting. Afterwards, he came up and he said, you know, I hate to agree with you about anything. And you're not the kind of person I want people to think I agree with. He said, but you were right. I didn't believe that either. Now, some people, it's not an argument I subscribe to, but you may have a different view. Some people say politicians are not paid enough. Yeah, that, is, is that no, tosh. <laughs> Don't even bother to give me the rest. I've been, a lot of people have been asking me that. The, look, when I was elected to Parliament uh, in 1979, that, that it was £1,750 a year and a limited expense account to pay for a secretary, but otherwise nothing. Since when? What are they on now? 80-odd? 80-odd, yeah. And, but it's also the way that they're invited to take the dash through bogus expenses claims, where, you know, you can put the wife on or the son or whatever on the payroll. I Not anymore. Well, we'll <laughs> see about that. But, but I can tell you... That the idea, look, this hits so many bad spots with me. First of all, why is politics a full time job? Why is it a profession? The profession of politics, where you know you go to university, stumble out, and become um, um, a, a research assistant, some um, leading figure in your party, and then you get into parliament. What use are people like that, actually, in truth? They've had no experience of anything. But more fundamentally, what they don't know is um, what they're not prepared to do is to take risks because this is their job. And if they lose their job, shung, where are they? Good point. Um, what surprised me when I was um, reading about your political journey, because obviously you were a big figure in the Conservative Party for a long time, but you left the Conservative Party in 2003. I did. I, I, you're not back? No, I wouldn't rejoin the Conservative Party. Um, I, 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 I left when Ian Duncan Smith became leader because Ian Duncan Smith, when he was uh, in his original form, he was very right wing and actually very difficult with John Major and so on. And suddenly he sort of decides, sniffs the air, feels where the wind is blowing and suddenly becomes some sort of liberal sort of, um, you know, um, charmer. And I just, I can't bear people like that. And I, and also, it's a terrible thing. Cut my tongue out. He's not very bright, is he? <laughs> I mean, when he was doing the pensions job, I don't think he understood it. And I, by the way, don't claim to be brilliantly bright, but I was bright enough, for instance, I don't know, to take things like the Police and Criminal Evidence Act, the major reform of criminal procedure th through Parliament every clause of it um, debated fully. And, you know, it's, 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 I understood it. I don't think he understood a lot of what he was trying to do. Let's inject some light, because spitting image, which <laughs> if you are of our age, it was essential viewing. Uh, I think millions and millions of people watch it every Sunday night. It's, it's on at the theatre now in, in London. Remind me which one. I shan't go. I just avoid that theatre. <laughs> it's good I've been to see it, although, my goodness, it's... I was thinking, is this a bit too much about certain characters? Um, you had... You were in Spitting Image. Is it a badge of honour when you make it as a politician? No, it's just silly. But I tell you, my wife said to me, one of your puppets is coming up for auction. We have to buy it because we can't let anyone else have it. We bought it and the bloody thing fell to pieces within a week. It was so <laughs> tattily made. And also, you know, they, they had to give somebody a bit of colour, you know. So, uh, I mean, one of the things I don't have, and I'll happily breathe all over you to prove it, I don't have bad breath, you see. I but confirm. They always had me as bad because they obviously wanted to say do something awful. And I thought... What is this? Is this wit, humour? I'd rather listen to Tony Hancock, you know? Did it hurt? Because, yeah, these horrible fumes were coming out of your spitting image. Because, yeah, would that sort of thing uh, hurt me? No, of course not. But it, it was just a waste of time. And so much of it was contrived and pretty third form stuff, I thought. And what's happened to that broken spitting image? It now? went into a dustbin. And 
it, I cannot disclose which dustbin, but it went into a dustbin. Oh. Not even a little moment of reflection. No, I can't even put... think where it went. I mean, it was, <laughs> it was slung out. Okay. Yes. OK. Despised. <laughs> it was rejected and thrown out. You brought some wit, um, some sharp tongues, as far as Ian Duncan Smith and Margaret Thatcher is, is um, are concerned. But loved it. Thank you, David Miller. Coming up, Bim Afalome. This Absolutely. was a guy who was continually written off and just kept going. And just, if you want an example of perseverance, in Churchill you definitely get it. Monday to Thursday nights on GB News. At 6, it's Deebs & Co. 7 o'clock, Farage. At 8, join Jacob Rees-Mogg. And at 9, Dan Wooten tonight, followed by headliners. On TV, radio and online, this is GB News. Now then, Lee Anderson here. Join me on GB News on my new show, The Real World, every Friday at 7pm, where real people get to meet those in power and hold them to account. Every week, we'll be hearing your views from up and down the country in the real world. Join me at 7 on GB News, Britain's news channel. Join me, Camilla Tomini, on Sunday mornings from 9.30, taking the politicians to task and breaking out of SW1 to see how their decisions are affecting you across the UK. Bursting the Westminster bubble every Sunday morning, only on GB News, the People's Channel. Britain's watching. Join us every night on GB News at 11pm for Headliners, which is three top comedians going through the next day's news stories, which is exactly what you need, because when the establishment has gone crazy, you need some craziness to make sense of it. So join us 11pm every night on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. I'm Andrew Doyle. Join me at 7 o'clock every Sunday night for Free Speech Nation, the show where I tackle the week's biggest stories in politics and current affairs with the help of my two comedian panellists and a variety of special guests. Free Speech Nation, Sunday nights from 7 on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. Every Sunday from 11, join Michael Portillo. There will be topical discussion, looking at the week before and the week to come. So kick back and relax at 11am on Sundays on GB News with me, Michael Portillo. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. I joined GB News because I was sick and tired of not hearing my views being represented, not just mine, but so many people that I knew and spoke to. I just couldn't get my voice out there. I couldn't say anything. I couldn't do anything. Whatever the narrative was, I kind of had to follow it. GB News is there to provide a voice for those who have been ignored by the establishment media. We think different things. We've got a different style. GB News is here to be optimistic and positive about the future. It's real kind of dynamic and flowing with the audience very much at the heart of it like a big family. Here at GB News, we talk about the things that matter to you. Hearing the voices from right across our towns and cities, especially our towns. All sides of the argument represented with a heavy dose of opinion. We're on a mission here to make a difference. And the GB News family really is here for you and whatever time of day you can watch or listen. Britain's watching. Britain's watching. We're proud to be GB News. The People's Channel. Britain's News Channel. Conservative MP Bim Afalomi, thank you for agreeing to chat to us today. You went to Eton. I did, yeah. One of the, well, the most prestigious private school in the country. Is going to Eton a help or a hindrance in politics? <laughs> I mean, I think on some level it depends who you ask, who you ask about that. In my view, I mean, look, my, my parents from Nigerian background, though my mum was born in Britain, medical family, we didn't go to Eton in some sort of, this is obviously the school that you will go to and all our ancestors have been here for generations, you know, I wasn't that sort. Uh, but I know that I was very privileged to get a brilliant education the way that I did. The really important thing about that school and its impact on just the national conversation, because I don't think that's too grandiose a way of describing it, is it gives people a sense, whoever you are, that all of these famous people in the past who've done things have been here Therefore, you can do it. Were you one of these young people who want, knew they wanted to be a politician at a young age? What I meant to say 
is that, no, I just sort of came across it in my 20s. No, because I was fascinated by current affairs. I mean, one thing about immigrant families yeah. is that often when you've come to this country, they, they're leaving something. They're either leaving um, not good economic opportunities or a chance to, to build a better life more broadly in, in a country like Britain. And they talk about politics constantly. When did you know that you wanted to be a politician? How old were you? I think probably by the age of 11 or 12. Wow. And I don't really remember that sort of, it wasn't some sort of light bulb moment or anything. But my history teacher at school, who I later found out was a senior member of the Egham Labour Party, this is in Surrey. Yeah, yeah. And he didn't say that at the time. I mean, I had no idea what his political views were. He used to talk to me about politics wow. and talk about his heroes who coincidentally were Harold Wilson, James Callaghan. And so I learned about politics actually at that age and he must have had an inkling that I was really interested in it. You become a politician. You thought you wanted to do it at 11. You always knew you were a Conservative way back then. Yeah. yeah. Wow, who's your hero? Just since you talked about your, your history teachers, who's your political hero? It's difficult. There are two people in particular I really admire. One is Churchill, not just for the reasons that everybody admires him, which is the war, but actually his ability to come back from seeming failure, which I think people underestimate. Yeah. You know, this Absolutely. was a guy who was continually written off and just kept going. And just, if you want an example of perseverance, in Churchill you definitely get it. Um, but another one, um, who is, it's a sort of you know, slightly strange one, is Benjamin Disraeli. Because as somebody from a, you know, a Nigerian background and reading a lot of the history and literature of the late Victorian era, the anti-Semitism is just completely open, completely suffusing that society and yet, somebody who had a Jewish background and never hid his background at all and was very ostensibly Jewish as well, he became prime minister. And I just think that that says a lot about the Conservative Party, but it also says a lot about him as a character and to put up with the things that he had to put up with in order to do it. Um, and he, Disraeli, I think, is a bit less fashionable now, but he's a really phenomenal character. Now, you were elected in 2017. Yeah, the Theresa May landslide that wasn't, as it were, as it were. <laughs> you got in, but yeah, there were some glum faces on, on, on your, your bench at that time. You're 31 years old. Mm. Is it too young? I don't think it's necessarily too young, but I think a lot of other people think it's too young. So when you come in, there are lots of people that will say, oh, well, um, you know, young Bim, how are you? You know, you, you, we'll... we'll when you're a bit older, we'll, we'll teach you to do this. And I, and I do think that, and they're not trying to be rude or condescending, it's just because you are so young, you can often get um, held back or, or the sense that, oh, well, you're going to be here for ages, so opportunities might go to someone else because of that sense. But at the same time, what I have found is because I, I was young, but I also was married, and we had, I think we had two, ch two children by then, and the lines on my eyes must have shown that I was slightly older than a typical 31-year-old. And the fact that you have been in politics from such a young age will give you an insight into the difficulties that your party faces with younger voters. You have written about these, these difficulties. Uh, you wrote a piece a couple of months ago citing research showing that just 21% of today's, 21% of today's 25 to 40-year-olds would vote for the Conservatives today. You are one of these this group. Um, why do you think that only one in five 25 to 40 year olds would vote for the Conservative Party? Basically I think it's because of economic opportunity and you know I was very lucky um, because when I left university I left just before the financial crisis. So when I left university opportunities seemed limitless for people of my generation and indeed I didn't go straight into politics I worked in the city for the best part of 10 years before coming into Parliament. There, were, there, was a, there was a sense that everything was getting better, that there were going to be more jobs, more opportunities, you're going to earn more money. And the financial crisis put pay to that. And the truth is, the country still hasn't fully recovered from the financial crisis. So if you're aged between 25 and 40, you have seen that as your early experience. And I'd say that the, the two ways in which this really plays itself out, the first are housing, and you will know about the difficulties of young people getting onto the housing ladder, and everybody watching this will appreciate that. But the second is just incomes. You know, 2007, median income. So this is just your median person. In cash terms, it hasn't really gone up since then. Exactly. So if you're a young person, you've really faced a lot of headwinds compared to your immediate 
predecessors. predecessors who saw rising income. So I, so I think that economics, the, that core thing of how much money you have at the end of the week, end of the month, and this is people, by the way, graduates, non-graduates, yeah. north, south, you know, it applies everywhere. I think that th solving for that problem is really the question of our politics today. Getting people's wages up or cutting their taxes, I suppose there's two ways yeah. of doing it. Yeah, no, no, 100%. And look, tuition fees is a part of this. Because, of course, if you've got graduates mm. who are now paying high tuition fees, £9,000 plus maintenance grant, that makes sense when people are getting the sort of jobs that I used, that I used to do in the city of London, or whatever, where you're earning really good salaries. Yeah. It makes sense. But for lots of other people, you know, a third of people, a third who go to university, they don't get, within five years, yeah. graduate level jobs. Yeah. So for these people, I mean, that's been a bad trade. And, it, and I think we need to, and I think yeah. we need to, and apprenticeships, everybody knows we need to increase. But I'm afraid, I think we need to defund some of those courses that are giving bad outcomes to young people and putting that money into further education. Give me some examples. Well, if you look at a lot of the statistics from the Office of Fair Students, mm. do a lot of this. And, and to be fair, we have actually been very transparent about all the data, yeah. so it's all there for people to see. There are many courses, mostly on the creatives or humanities side, but not exclusively, that still cost the same as studying engineering at Imperial University, for example, yeah. Imperial College, which is you know, one of the top places in the world, still cost the same to the student. But yet the outcomes in terms of earnings are below what that same person would have been able to earn in a non-graduate job. Let's put some of that money that we're putting into that course. And by the way, those students aren't going to pay back their student yeah, loans, so yeah. the Treasury is losing out. Yeah. Let's put that into getting our skills up in areas where we know we have a deficit of people. Interesting. Uh, final question. Do you have to be more woke to get in touch with the younger generation? So it's really interesting. When we did the research um, with Onward, looking at the sort of missing millennials we talked about, I expected in the focus groups a lot of these people to talk about, oh, well, you know, we think the Tories are old-fashioned or we think that they're not, you know, socially liberal enough. What was really difficult was getting them to talk about it. I mean, they really didn't seem to engage with it very much at all. And I was really, and I said to the team before, and I said to the, we, we sent messages to the moderator before saying, look, really press them on the cultural things. Yeah. And actually, what they wanted to talk about was the economy. Yeah. They wanted to talk about the amount of money they had and their opportunities. Yes, and that so was, culture wars, there's no future for the Tories no, in no, going down that no, track. And, and it, but it, it's important because there are some in my party who think this is the route for conservative success. And that doesn't mean that they're wrong about these questions. I actually happen to think that they're right about a lot of these questions. But the question is, what do you prioritise and what's going to make a difference to people's lives? And I just do not think, for most people, particularly millennials aged under 40, that is the thing. It's going to be getting their economic opportunities up, making sure they make more money, that's earnings and cutting their taxes, and giving them opportunities to own a home. And if we can do that, then we've got a chance. I really enjoyed that. Bim Afalomi, Conservative MP, thank you. Thank you. The MPs are taking a summer break, and so am I. See you in September. The temperature's rising. Boxed Solar. Proud sponsors of weather on GB News. Hello and welcome to your latest weather update from the Met Office. I'm Marco Patania. We hold on to unsettled weather conditions across the UK during the week ahead. I think we'll all see further rain at times and feeling quite chilly too in the brisk breeze. Low pressure is dominating at the moment, a fairly deep area of low pressure, gradually pulling away towards the east of the UK over the next day or so. But notice this snow moving band of rain across the central slice of the UK that continues to give some heavy bursts through the evening. In fact, we have a weather warning in force until midnight. And that band then pushes south into southern parts of England and Wales into the early hours. The far southeast holds on to some clear spells and clearer with a few showers towards the north and northwest, but turning chilly under those clear spots towards the northwest too. Temperatures into single figures here. As for Monday, well, it's a case of fairly wet conditions across the south during the morning, some heavy bursts of rain at times, giving way to brighter skies from the north and northwest, but fresh air moving in too. So as we head into the afternoon, most parts are becoming brighter, still a scattering of showers, particularly towards the north and northwest. And once again, fairly chilly for the time of year. Temperatures generally peaking in the mid-teens towards the north, a high down towards the south of 19 or 20, 20 is 68 in Fahrenheit. 
Tuesday looks set to see another day of sunshine and showers. The showers quite uh, well scattered towards the south and east of the UK, but quite a few packing in towards the north and northwest in a fairly chilly north to northwesterly breeze. And once again, temperatures peaking in the high teens locally to around 20 degrees. Further rain is expected around the middle of the week, giving way to sunshine and showers again on Thursday. The temperatures rising. Boxed Solar. Proud sponsors of weather on GB News. What you get for breakfast is something that, if we do our jobs right, you will wake up to news that you didn't know the night before. It's a conversation. It's not just me and Eamon. We want to get to know you, and we want you to get to know us. From 6, it's Breakfast with Eamon and Isabel. Monday to Thursdays on GB News. Britain's news channel. Westminster is going around in ever-decreasing circles, followed by the media. Britain is broken. How on earth did we get into this mess? But more importantly, how do we get out of it? Join me at 7pm, Monday to Thursdays, on Farage, here on GB News. We will have open, rational debate. We've got to work out how Britain moves forward from this. Join us here on GB News, the People's Channel. Britain is watching. When the news happens, it happens here. And really important breaking news. Breaking news this morning. On TV, radio and online, the news starts here on Britain's Newsroom. All the biggest stories and the answers that you need from across the UK and beyond. Join Britain's Newsroom from 9.30 on GB News. The People's Channel, Britain's news channel. Join me, Patrick Christie's Monday to Friday, 3 till 6. We tackle the day's news agenda like you've never seen before. It's high tempo, high octane, the most controversial topics and the best guests. You will not be able to take your eyes and ears off it. I'm not afraid to ask the questions that you really want answered. 3 till 6 p.m. Monday to Friday on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. People in Britain, they love free speech, but they also love fair play. I don't care if I'm speaking somebody from a trade union, from the Labour Party, somebody from the SNP. And I think the viewers like to see that actually we can challenge one another, but in a positive way. We think we ask the questions that people want to ask, and often we ask the questions that we wanted to ask in Parliament but never got the chance to ask. So join us every Saturday, 10am till noon on GB News. Britain's news channel. It's all about family, being in people's living rooms, all the interaction and getting to know who our viewers and listeners are. When I was young, my dad used to say, no, no, stop arguing. I wanted an outlet that would enable me to give my opinion. People are going through a really hard time right now. And I know that you don't feel like you're being listened to by the establishment. I came to GB News because it's the people's channel and I want the 